So um, we're going to address a uh, question that you brought up last week as well as included here in this answer. Uh, is we're going to be on question 112. It's 112 um, in the workbooks for the foundations. So uh, 112 reads, is are God's blessings and condemnations conditional and therefore changeable? Are God's blessings and condemnations conditional and therefore changeable? Any opinions on that right off the bat? Well, one big thing we do have a uh, freedom of will. Yeah. So that's you the, think that would have an effect on things? That's that's that would be a factor, exactly. Yep. So, and we're going to get into that. And let's look at 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, just to verify how this works and the fact that uh, there are realities about this. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. And his answer is yes, they are changeable. And they are based, as Al mentioned, on our actions and response to his word during our time. So let's go ahead and take a look at some verses to support and understand this. To start with, 1 Corinthians 11.31. Go ahead and who would like to read that? But if we judged ourselves... We would not come under judgment. Okay, so that's where it starts, as if we are self-disciplined. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, then, and correct ourselves, then we don't need discipline. Uh, we don't need to be disciplined uh, by God if we, even though we've done something bad, been doing something bad, but we realize it and we decide, well, we will, as we talked about in the previous class, repent, turn away from that, and uh, do something better or do what God wants us to do. As we discussed in the previous class, repentance basically is a turning. It's uh, basically uh, the idea of changing our mind, which follows by changing our actions, our hand in hand. So let's go ahead and take a look at this other verse regarding that, uh, regarding God uh, and his blessings or condemnations and uh, whether they are changeable. When God says something, is that that's it. God said it. That's the done. And that's what some people would assume. So they kind of put God in a box saying, well, God said this, therefore he's got to do this. But they sometimes don't read the fine print, as they say. Um, but bottom line, here's some fine print you might say in the Bible, even though it's very obvious, very glaring in support of, of what Jonah was talking about in Nineveh. How Nineveh was under condemnation. And by the way, while I speak, let's look at Jeremiah 18, starting at 7. Jeremiah chapter 18. So let's go ahead and turn there. And Jeremiah was written 150 years after Jonah to support what happened there at Nineveh. And God knew that Nineveh wouldn't change without a serious understanding that they're going to fall under judgment. And everybody will fall under judgment sooner or later. In Nineveh's case, it was going to be sooner unless they changed. And they did change. Therefore, the evil city that did so many corrupt things repented, turned around, and they repented of their sins and their activities that were evil and turned towards God in respect and honor to God. And God lifted that and gave them a reprieve, uh, saying, you don't need to be destroyed since you judged yourself, changed your ways. And uh, there was a wicked city was destroyed by revival instead of annihilation. And that's what God would prefer. Here's uh, something to support that, that that was written 150 years later, Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. Let's read that in King James and uh, let's go ahead and uh, hear what that says. 7 through 10? 7 through 10. At what instant at what instant I shall speak uh, concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil way, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Okay. And, uh, is that all the way 7 through 10? 
if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Okay, and that passage talks about repenting of turning around, away from turning around, from blessing them if they're not going to walk in God's blessings. Israel was going to be blessed as long as they walked in God's blessings. They did not, and uh, since they didn't, uh, then they were dispersed, uh, and history shows that they suffered many things because of not walking with uh, God and following God's leadership. And uh, so, anyways, so they are conditional. It's pretty clear there. It applies to a nation. It applies to an individual. And uh, there's a quote here from the book, The Foundations, which is the textbook that this all comes from. Now, by the way, this is backwards in the phone because it's mirrored image. This is like a selfie, the way this is set up real easily to do for these live classes. But the book there contains this quote. And I think it's a good quote to describe how God can change. Now, why God changes when he pronounces like judgment or he pronounces blessing, how those things can be changed depending on the circumstances. And that would be a righteous thing to do. Uh, it's not wrong. God didn't lie. He was in full intention. If something didn't change, that those things would happen. But uh, here's a quote here from the book, The Foundations, and it says, you can adjust your action according to a moving target. If you didn't adjust and refocus, you would miss the target. And that would be sin as defined earlier. God never sins. His eye is always on the target and his actions are true. So it's like a moving target. Our actions are changing. And God says something when you're here, but then you move over here. And so if God pulled the trigger, he would miss the target. And that's what the, the definition of sin is an archery term saying that you missed the target. You fell short. You didn't hit the bullseye. So that's the idea. And God never sins. He's always focused on the target. Since the target moved, obviously, for him to be on target, he would have to move. And so things change. So Al's question that in the class, after class last week, was how can a all-knowing, Sovereign God, who knows everything, changes mind. And uh, so we're going to address that a little bit. And the first thing, as we talked about after class a little bit, and we'll share here, because that's a good question. Theologians actually would ask that same question. And uh, how can an all-knowing, sovereign God change his mind? And to understand those things, we need to understand the Trinity, as we talked about earlier in earlier classes. And the fact is that the Father... And the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are distinctive. They have different traits and attributes, but they're a part of one God. Just like I have a body, a soul, and a nature. My human nature makes me human. But nevertheless, we're not going to get into the human nature and people so much as God's Trinity. God's Trinity has three parts. The Bible is very clear about that. And most people don't understand the distinctiveness, importance of those three parts and how they are different. And we talked about in previous classes how the Father is the only one in the Trinity that is omnipresent. The very word omnipresent means that you're always in the same place, all the time. There's nowhere that you are not. Jesus can come and go. So by definition of being able to come and go, you are not omnipresent. The Holy Spirit can come and go. Jesus said he's going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can come into the heart of a person that's what makes them a born-again Christian is the spirit of Jesus coming into our heart so the Holy Spirit and Jesus both can come and go but the Father because it's what the Bible is very clear that somebody in the Trinity is omnipresent is always somewhere everywhere at the same time and there's nowhere that he is not now if somebody is omnipresent the Bible is very clear that Jesus can come and go the Holy Spirit can come and go there's only one left that can be omnipresent Therefore, it must be the Father. And Jesus kind of illustrated that in saying, the Father's greater than I. Greater in the sense that he's omnipresent. Where Jesus can come and go, and Jesus is in the moment, which has different uh, benefits. But the fact is, to understand the Father being omnipresent, he's also all-knowing. He knows everything. And we're going to get into some verses regarding that, but Jesus acknowledged that only the Father knows some of these things. 
There's nothing the Father does not know already. So he's all-knowing, he's everywhere, and he crosses all time. At the same time, he's in the beginning when Adam and Eve was created, and before that, when the angels and different things happened, and after that, when Jesus comes back, he's there right now. And beyond that, with the new heavens and new earth, he's there right now, at the same moment that he's here right now. There's nowhere the Father is not in time, space, or oh, he knows everything because he is everywhere. He knows what's in our head, our thinking. We went over these things when we studied the Trinity. He knows what comes into our mind, where it came from even, where these thoughts came from. That is the Father. He's mind-boggling because he's beyond our real comprehension to realize that he is everywhere and he knows everything at the moment. Everything is, he's the great I am. He's, he's, he's always everywhere at the same time. Now, God is the great I am. Jesus could say the same thing because he is always, you know, somewhere. But the bottom line is that the Father is always everywhere. And uh, so bottom line is that even on the cross, when Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was not talking to the Father as everybody seems to say. He was talking to the Holy Spirit, which left him at that moment, who is also God, because the Father cannot turn away he cannot go away. That's the definition of being omnipresent. He was present there consistently. And to verify that, Jesus in his next phrase says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So he wouldn't have left away. And Jesus wouldn't have said, Why have you forsaken me? And then turn around and say, Father, I'm going to commit my hands, my spirit into your hands. See, so the Father was there. He's got to be there because he's omnipresent. So bottom line is the Father cannot change his mind. He has no reason to change his mind. He knows everything right now. There's nothing new to the Father. He knows everything and nothing is new. Now he can experience new things and new feelings and emotions through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the other two members of the Trinity. That's what makes the Father complete. He can experience these things because of them. But personally, he doesn't ever change. He's the unchangeable God. He never changes because he never has to. He knows everything, and therefore he cannot have a new thought or change his mind. On the other hand, Jesus will focus on in the Trinity is at one point in time. Let's take a look at John eleven thirty five. John eleven thirty five, and Jesus is in a moment of time. <coughs> He's enjoying that moment. He's fully in that moment, and uh, we're going to look at some things regarding Jesus. It was supplies also quite often to the Holy Spirit, but especially we're going to focus on Jesus because it's real obvious there. And so, looking at John eleven thirty five, Jesus is completely in the moment. Wherever he is, whenever he is present, he is completely there. John eleven thirty five. Maybe. Go ahead. Jesus wept. There you go. That's a tough one, isn't it? So, Jesus isn't always weeping. But here was a situation where it's sad. And Jesus can and did weep. He's sad. He's, he's, uh, that's the shortest verse. Most people memorize that verse first. And it's a good verse. Because Jesus has emotions. And he's emotionally changed by the situation that he's involved in. As we should be. Let's take a look at Genesis 6. 7 through, or 5 through 7. Jesus can change his emotions, therefore, his thoughts change. He has a variety of thoughts he goes through, as well as emotions he goes through. Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Go ahead and read that. Lord, Lord, saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind <clears throat> whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures, and move along the ground the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. Okay, so here, 
God is grieved. Jesus can be grieved. Jesus is here being grieved because his creation had become so corrupted. They're so self-destructive, so opposite of what they could be if they wanted to enjoy a uh, uh, blessed life. And it grieved him uh, to the point this is right before Noah's flood. And the reason for Noah's flood in part, and Noah found favor with God. Uh, Noah was one of the few, and probably the only at the time, obviously the only follower except for his wife and, uh, and, and his kids, uh, three, child, three children and their wives. So they were saved um, to repopulate the earth. But the bottom line is he could be grieved. Now the father is not grieved because he knew about this and he knew the end result and he knew how everything plays out. But the bottom line is, uh, in the Bible, uh, in King James translation, refers to God repented uh, in this verse uh, a couple of times. Uh, he changed his mind in the sense that, you know what, I, I, uh, I, I regret that I've made people. Now, when he made Adam and Eve, he had a, a, a good time with them the first day. Um, they, they fellowshiped and stuff. Uh, they walked together and talked together and enjoyed fellowship before Adam fell. And uh, so there was a, a, a idea of they are created for pleasure, for fellowship, and God was grieved in this point. He can be grieved, and he was grieved. And let's look at Second uh, Peter three nine. Fact is, though God, who is involved in creation and and uh, population and all that sort of things, is not willing that anybody perishes. He's not creating anybody to go to hell. That's where as uh, Al mentioned about we have a free will. We can choose to follow God and follow what's good or follow what's evil and follow the Satan. So bottom line is it is our choice, but we're not created to follow Satan. We're not created to go to hell. And uh, so uh, that would be a, a Presbyterian, that would be actually a doctrine that's a Calvinistic doctrine that basically everybody that goes to heaven has been chosen by God. And uh, that's actually a false doctrine if you read the Bible and listen to earlier classes that illustrate how they misunderstand total depravity applies to the old nature, not to the soul. And God speaks to every single soul. And this verse can also be applied, we're about to read in 2 Peter 3, 9. And the uh, fact is that uh, if God chooses who goes to heaven, he also chooses who goes to hell. Therefore, when he creates that person, allows that person to be born, he creates them to go to hell if he's not going to choose them. That's not God. That's a false warp doctrine. He doesn't choose between who's going to heaven and hell. We choose. The Bible says that over and over. Uh, he enables everyone to make a choice. That's because he's a righteous God. People don't understand that. There's a lot of misconceptions on salvation, how we get saved. But it's our choice whether we want, if everybody gets a little light at some point, and uh, we go into that in the book, The Foundations, that everybody, without exception, even the unborn will have an opportunity later in the millennium, uh, as uh, we illustrate in the book. Bottom line is there's no exceptions to that. Everybody has an opportunity. God doesn't create anybody to go to hell, nor does anybody get a free pass without making a choice. The angels didn't get a free pass. They made a choice. Some went with Satan, became demonic forces and principalities, Others stayed with God, and they're the good angels. And every human will make a choice as well. Uh, so bottom line is here, God doesn't make a choice for us, and he doesn't want us to go to hell. Basically, he didn't create us to go to hell. So let's look at 2 Peter 3, 9. Let's go ahead and read that. Okay. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So he's not willing that anyone should perish. That's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They're actively working on every individual at some point to give them salvation. That's their desire. He's not willing that anybody should perish. Now the Father already knows who's going to perish before what was ever thought about being created. Because he sees everything at once. So the father is not involved in this idea of being able to change his mind. But here it says God is not willing that anybody should perish. Is there a point where God changes his mind about that and is willing that some perish? You think there's a point when that happens? The flood. Huh? The flood. 
Well, that was one point right there. He was willing that some perish there because of their corruption. So he changed his mind there, in a sense. Instead of fill the earth and be blessed, it's like, no, here we're going to be wiped clean. I'm going to start out again. So there was a change there. And even more so, there's a change here. When God's not willing anybody should perish, he's referring to going to hell. Perish permanently, going to the graveyard in heaven, and uh, staying there forever. And he's not willing that anybody goes there and perish. But the fact is, Jesus is actively working, so we will be saved. The Holy Spirit's actively working on everybody's heart. The more we pray for somebody, the more they work on them. But at some point, they will change their mind if you resist and become so stiff-necked that you obviously will never receive the Holy Spirit will never, in your heart to become a child of God. You will never walk in God's ways, and He will give up on individuals. And He will be willing then. He's not willing anybody should perish. On the other hand, He is willing for those individuals. He will resign Himself and change His mind. I'm not willing for you to perish, put it individually. Anybody. So he's looking at one individual. Let's say it's Hitler. He's not willing that Hitler perishes. But at one point in his life, Hitler's life, he says, I'm sorry, I'm willing that you perish because you refuse to change your way. So I've changed my mind. I don't want you to perish. But now I accept that you will resist and corrupt everything around you. So I'm willing because of the good of the bigger picture to have you perish. Now, some people get resigned, as I believe Hitler was, before they die, and uh, become very demonic. But the bottom line is, God will work on some people until the very day that they die. But after you die, that's it. And then we apply this next verse, Revelations 20, 15. And this is just illustrating that Jesus can change his mind. The Holy Spirit can change his mind. Because he's not willing that anybody should perish. And yet, on the other hand, there comes a point where he changes his mind about those individuals. Anybody includes everybody. So he does, and he knows it's going to happen, but he works individually on individuals to say, you know what, I really want you to be saved, but it's your choice. But in the end, if we resist, then this will apply. Revelation 20, 15. Let's go ahead and read that. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, now how we get our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's in the Lamb's Book of Eternal Life. There's, I believe there's, the Bible says there's multiple books in heaven that will be used at Judgment Day. There's a book of life, which is mortal life. We can be and will be blotted out of that at some point if we don't receive eternal life. This is the book of Lamb's Book of Life, is eternal life. So when your name is written in there, is the same moment you receive the Holy Spirit of Jesus in your heart. You become his child. It's a birth certificate, you might say, of your born again experience. Have you been born again? Is your name recorded in the birth certificate of God saying, this is a child of mine, Lamb's Book of Life. So that happens when you're born again. And once you're there, you cannot be blotted out because the Holy Spirit, when he comes in, he says, I'll never leave you. In spite of anything you do, you can be a bad child and lose all your rewards in heaven. But no matter what, heaven is a free gift. And because you receive the Holy Spirit at that point, whether you're young or old, and uh, you ask Jesus into your heart, is what it basically boils down to realizing I can't get to heaven on my own. I'm not perfect. I, I would pollute heaven if I went on my own in the condition I'm in. Then we receive the Holy Spirit, and that's what we come and born again. What Jesus said to Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. And that's what the experience is talking about. That experience is... It's a, it's a one-time experience. It's like the first time I was born is a one-time experience into the family of man. And then we're born again into the family of God. We become an adopted child of God, you might say, a part of his family, and to live with him forever. That family will be concluded before Jesus comes back to this earth. At the judgment seat of Christ, everybody in his family gets rewarded and judged according to their works. They attend the wedding feast of the Lamb, where we're joined to the family in every way. At the judgment seat of Christ, the old man is removed from us. So we're no longer sinners. We no longer have the identity of sin because the old man is corrupted and what causes us to sin. So it's removed. It's called the circumcision of the heart, done without hands. And it's removed, leaving only the divine nature, the Holy Spirit, which will be with us forever. And he says once he comes in, he'll never leave us. It's by covenant that he's there. 
Jesus established that covenant. It's called the New Testament covenant, the New Covenant that Jesus established with his own blood as the Lamb of God, paying for our sins, enabling us to receive this gift that he provided, the Holy Spirit. Simply receiving it, it's a gift, so therefore we don't have to pay with our good works or any actions. It's just a matter of receiving it. We can also reject it. But once you receive it, your book, your lamb, your book, uh, your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you are forever saved. So no matter what, then you're part of his child. If you reject that, then Jesus will change his mind, saying, I'm sorry, my payment was enough to save the whole world. But since you wouldn't allow me to apply it to you, you will not be saved. And he will change his mind about your salvation, and you will basically be lost. And because Jesus is living in the moment. Let's go ahead and read uh, Proverbs 5. Um, let me see where I'm at. Uh, uh, okay, I think I lost my place, but nevertheless. Uh, okay, Jesus. Uh, Let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, okay, uh, it's, uh, what was the last verse we read? That was one of Revelation. Revelation. Okay, uh, let's go back and see uh, from that. Let's take a look at uh, Jeremiah 23, 24. And uh, Jeremiah 23, 24. So that's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But in summary, understanding the Trinity helps us understand how God is the same all the time, and yet he can change. He can change his mind. He can change his approach. Um, it's always uh, according to the circumstances and in light of the bigger picture. We'll get into that. But let's look at Jeremiah 23, 24. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him? declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Now who's speaking here? God. And what's part of God? God is speaking for sure. And uh, But what's part of God is speaking here? They all have a voice. The Father has a voice. The Holy Spirit has a voice. They're all recorded in the Bible. And Jesus has a voice, obviously. The Father spoke at Jesus' baptism, matter of fact, and everybody's aware of that. Jesus also spoke, I mean, the Holy Spirit also speaks and spoke to people through Acts, in the book of Acts, I mean. But uh, now, who is speaking here? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? It would be the Father. It would be the Father. Because he's filling heaven and earth. That's what we're talking about, the Father is omnipresent. So let's look at Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. So, this is again referring to the Father. He sees everything, everywhere, all the time. He sees the evil and all the evil things going on. He doesn't hide himself from those things. He sees everything. As a matter of fact, sometimes, like in Jeremiah's case, he showed Jeremiah situations that were very evil, that he was unaware of. Excuse me? And uh, he went ahead and uh, showed him. And the Father knows and sees everything. There's, he's in every single place, seeing every single thing. And on Judgment Day, he is a reliable witness to say, these things all took place during your lifetime. Uh, and Jesus will be involved there. But the Father actually sees it firsthand. He was there. He's a firsthand witness. And he sees everything. Let's take a look at Proverbs 15.3. We just did that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having a tough time keeping track today, aren't I? Uh, Matthew 24, 36. Let's take a look at that. Matthew 24, verse 36. I 
remember a lot of writing that I put in the workbook. So I get this, I'm, I'm dyslexic and don't read very well, actually. And uh, so I get uh, lost in all these words sometimes when I'm actually trying to just look at things and say things. But here we are at Matthew 24, 36. Let's see what that has to say. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, now who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus is speaking here, the Son himself. So Jesus is speaking here, and he says that nobody knows, not the angels, not even the Son, nobody knows except for the Father. Therefore, there are things that the Father knows that even other parts of the Trinity doesn't actually know because they don't, don't have first-hand knowledge right there. Jesus is in one point in time, he's enjoying and being totally all in that moment, but he's totally understanding of all of history, and yet he's understanding the predictions of the future better than we do, so he sees the bigger picture, but like he says, and this is referring to his second coming, he doesn't know the day that he's coming back, because he's not living on that future day, he's living today, where he's in, today is in heaven with the Father and preparing a place for us right now and are praying for us right now and doing those things in heaven right now and are preparing for our, our homecoming when the time comes, uh, he comes to get us. But nevertheless, uh, so nobody knows, he says, except for the Father of these things, his second coming being that thing that he's referring to right there. There are things because the Father knows everything because he's right now, at this moment, he's watching Jesus' return. He can look at the clock at any part in the world and tell you exactly what time to the second. Well, this is when he's going to break the clouds. This is when he's going to touch the ground. This is what's going to happen next, because I'm watching it. The Father can see those things. He knows those things intimately. Without, He's got good vision. And the uh, fact is, he sees all these things, but and he can relate them to Jesus, but Jesus doesn't see them except for through the Father, and uh, because he's not living there right now. So he says, nobody knows except the Father. So let's take a look at Mark 13, 32. You know, we're in conclusion. We have several verses we want to go through though, to verify these things. So let's uh, quickly read these. Uh, Mark 13, 32. But in that day and that hour knows no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So that's what we're talking about. That He's referring to that uh, in more than one place. And so that's the fact that only the Father knows these things. He says he doesn't know them. He's the Son of Man and Son of God. And uh, referred to as the term uh, sometimes applied to him. But the uh, fact is, so... He gained, gained new knowledge, new understanding, ex ex experienced new things, which is a good thing. Now let's look at Luke 10, 18. Jesus can remember the past. He has no memory problem. He can choose to think on certain things and uh, stuff or not think on other things. But he remembers the past uh, very well and goes infinitely back. And here's uh, Jesus again talking regarding the past, beyond what the history of man was, Luke 10, 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So he, he was there when Satan was cast into heaven. He remembers that. He's part of God. Satan was a created angel who wanted to be like God and had corrupted himself with his pride. And God says, okay, you can no longer be part of my kingdom. And Satan wanted his own kingdom, and he's got it. It's on the earth today, and it's a corrupt kingdom. He's a ruler and the prince of the power of the air. And everything he does is the opposite of God. And because that's what happens when you enter corruption and leave perfection, is it automatically turns off the light. And when you turn off the light, it just automatically happens. You're in darkness. And in darkness, all kinds of things happen that are negative. And that's what happened, and the Satan is getting his way in some ways in order to give us a choice. There's a bigger picture here because he was going to have a family that he never had before. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was going to expand their family in a way that they've never had before with angels. 
And that's the whole purpose of this time frame and God's large picture and calendar is this is a time of developing God's family. And we have a choice to be part of that family, which is a ruling class in heaven. God says uh, that we will actually rule over angels. And uh, there's more creations in the future. But when God's family is completed, when he comes back to earth, there will be no more additions to the family of God. And the heaven uh, this has a capital city. There's no more expansions to that capital city. It is a certain size, but it'll never be overpopulated. We can always have visitors and we have a home there, but those homes are permanent, not to be expanded once everything is concluded and Jesus comes back. This is a very opportunity time, opportunist time for us. It's a very privileged time. Uh, we are, we don't even realize the benefits and uh, the fact is what God has in, in mind for his family, how it's so special beyond anything else in all of his kingdom. Let's go ahead and read. Um, did we read John 14, 2 and 3? Yeah. Let's go ahead and read that. Now, Jesus is going to be enjoying the moment when that time comes. He's enjoying the moment right now. Um, Jesus' emotions can change. Um, Jesus is just as much a part of God as the Father is, as the Holy Spirit is. They all have different abilities. And uh, because of that, God is complete. He has no lack. John 14, 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I can <coughs> prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So he's at that place right now. He's doing an activity, preparing us to places I was just talking about. And he's going to come back again, as he said. There's no change in that. There's certain things that are not going to change. That's, that's a fact of life. But no matter when he comes back, that's subject to change. And that's part of the reason he doesn't know, because it partly depends on us in some ways. And the various things that he has planned, such as revivals and different things that have not been fulfilled yet before he comes back. And uh, we won't get into that right now because we don't have the time. And uh, we're talking about actually his individuality and the idea that he's at one place. He says, I'm going and I'm preparing this place and I'm coming again. Let's look at Genesis 18, 20 through 21. Uh, some people may not realize this. This is also talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. First book of the Bible, Genesis 18, 20 through 21. Jesus is in one place at one time, therefore he has first-hand knowledge of that place, but not of every place. Now he can get understanding and knowledge with reports from the Father. Um, so he's not lacking, but he can focus on one specific thing where he's at at that time and what's going on and where he's going to go next. Uh, Genesis 18, 20 through 21, let's read that. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous i will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the city of it which is come unto me and if not i will know okay uh, he says i, I am the lord and he's uh, speaking uh he's going to go down he's in a place he's in heaven he got a report he's going to go down and see Sodom and gomorrah he wants first-hand knowledge because place is about to be destroyed similar to Nineveh but Sodom and Gomorrah is not going to change and they were destroyed uh, so bottom line is that's Jesus learning he wants confirmation first-hand knowledge of this situation he says go down that I may see I may see and understand fully now it's not like he's lacking he understands he already got a report but he wants to have first-hand knowledge so and that's what uh, that's what referring to Jesus. I wouldn't be referring to the Father because the Father's already there right now. Uh, so that's Jesus going down to see. Let's look at Luke seven nine. And when you see things and you learn things and you experience new things as Jesus does and can do, your emotions change, your thinking change. 
Luke 7, 9. Luke 7, 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him. He said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. So here Jesus is speaking, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something to think that you could amaze God. Imagine that. Doing something that would amaze God. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. He is God. And this guy that came with the faith that he had amazed him. And there's other words along that line that are used. But uh, that's the fact that he could be amazed, impressed. You can impress God. Now, can you impress the Father? Yeah, well, through Jesus understanding that. But the Father already sees everything. He's not so emotionally moved as Jesus would be experiencing and being focused on that very moment. So bottom line is that he was amazed. He's focused on that moment. Let's look at Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10, one more time. And, uh, well, maybe we, in light of time, uh, we won't go there. Let's go to Matthew 23, 37. Because in Jeremiah, we'd already read at the beginning of class where it talks about nations. If you choose if God's blessing was upon a nation, he said he would bless them, but they do wrong, then his blessing could be removed. And if condemnation was on a nation, but they repent and do right, then his condemnation could be removed. And that's what Jeremiah 18, 10 through, or 7 through 10 says. And we've been through that. But that's the fact that Jesus can actually change his decree, good or bad. And he can be amazed. He can be sad. He wept. Uh, he's a, he's, he's uh, in tune with the situation at the moment. Let's look at Matthew 23, 37. Let's go ahead, go ahead and read that. Matthew chapter 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under the wings, but you were not willing. Okay, so Jesus is, can change his mind. He, he can make decisions and, uh, and uh, decide on certain things according to the circumstances. And then those circumstances change. As we said, the target changes. He can change his opinion because he's in the moment. He can change his mind because of the situation has changed. But it's always righteous. As it says here, uh, it's according to the circumstances. He would have rather gathered them together, but they resisted. They would not. And uh, let's uh, finish in Luke 22, 42. So Jesus can change his mind in light of the circumstances. God can change his mind in light of the circumstances because the circumstances have changed. And he's living in the moment. And he's experiencing that moment one moment at a time, one, one day at a time, you might say, one year at a time, even though you got the bigger picture. I see the bigger picture in many things, and yet I'm experiencing one day at a time. In a similar way, Jesus makes decisions and moments at the moment a time he's in. He's not living right now in the past. He knows the past. He's not living right now in the future. He knows very much about the future, but he's living in the moment. Right now he's preparing a place for us. But he's making his decisions based on circumstances, situations. But it's in light of the bigger picture. So he's always seeing the bigger picture and realizing, i got to make a decision according to the bigger picture, even though sometimes the circumstances would lead you to do it something different. So he's looking at both these things at the same time. So he always makes a sinless, correct, righteous decision. When he changes his mind, it's the right thing to do. If he shows mercy, it's the right thing to do. If he lays judgment on somebody, that's the right thing to do for that moment, at that time, in light of the bigger picture of how it would affect everything else in creation. And this is what he's illustrating right here in Luke 22, 42. Let's go ahead and read that. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So he's under the impression and impact of the Father saying, not my will I'm looking at. Father, you're greater than I. You see the bigger picture. <coughs> Not my will, but your will be done. Because here he's emotionally moved to preserve his life. He knows what's about to happen. He's about to be tortured. Nobody likes that. He's about to be beaten, embarrassed, spit upon, in every way misused, and put on a cross, which is one of the most painful deaths you could have. It was developed to have excruciation comes from crucifixion, and the word excruciation. And uh, it's an excruciating time for a matter of hours on a cross, but it's all symbolic 
in the past leading up to that moment of reality that he's about to pay for our sins. So he wasn't emotionally moved to say, no problem. No, there was, there was something that he was seriously disturbed about. But he, and he needed a little confirmation from the Father. He said, is there any other way? And uh, that's really his human nature speaking. Because he had a human nature at that point when he was born into this world. He received a new identity, a human nature. So his human nature wanted to live. He had to struggle between his soul and his human nature. But empowering his soul was the Father. The Holy Spirit was there empowering him as well. And he was there when he got baptized and started doing miracles. He left him on the cross to be the spotless Lamb of God. And he came back and then redeemed him in hell and uh, raised him from the dead. And uh, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit. Hell had uh, multiple parts at the time. But then he set the captives free that are in the better part of hell. Adam, Abraham's bosom. Adam was there. Abraham was there. Jonah went there for a little time and then went back there after he died. But bottom line is that um, he actually experienced that emotion of dread and he sweated blood because he was tempted in such a way to not go through this because it was repulsive to him. And he not only was going to suffer physically but mentally because the sins of the world was going to be placed upon him and his mind probably was going to be at the very end flooded with some evil that he didn't uh, desire to have. Um, some people believe that. I think it's a possibility when the sins of the world were placed upon him. Um, I believe that was the moment that he took the alcohol for the first time to his lips right at the very end. They placed that sponge. They call it vinegar, but mostly alcohol tastes like vinegar back then. And they sometimes use both words. Um, so anyways, uh, and we'll get into that another time about him and uh, not drinking alcohol before that. It would have been sin for a prince to do that. He was a prince of peace. It's sin for a king to do that. He was a king of kings, as the Bible says in Proverbs and different things. And he would not promote drunkenness or sinfulness. So he would not promote hundreds of gallons of alcohol at a party. He would actually make something that tasted great, but wouldn't, but wouldn't pollute your mind. And uh, so when he made all that wine at the first miracle with the power of the Holy Spirit, it was not an alcoholic beverage, so anybody could get drunk, even though many of them probably were facing that already. All the wine had won out, run out. They are probably feeling pretty good from that. But his tasty drink was refreshing in such a way that it didn't make you uh, stupid, foolish. And uh, so anyway, bottom line is that he gets emotionally moved, but every decision he makes is in light of the bigger picture. Therefore, he's looking at the bigger picture and saying, Father, I need your advice, I need your help, I need your encouragement, whatever it is. And he always makes the right decision. It's never out of line. They're always in harmony, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they experience life at a different rate, a different type of perception. The Father sees everything. Jesus sees what's in front of him and says, you know what? This is emotionally disturbing to me, or this amazes me. You're great. I, I, I'm, God bless you because I can't believe that you are so outstanding in what you've just done, the sacrifice you made, the understanding you have, or whatever the case was, the faith that you're activated in. Uh, so bottom line is, he's emotionally moved, therefore his condemnations can be changed, and his blessings can be changed. He's looking at the moment, and we gotta live in the moment. So we can't live in the future either, we can't live in the past, we gotta forget the past, as Paul said, I forget what's in the past and I move on towards what God's calling me to do. And God enables us to do that because he does that. And Jesus is empowering uh, us to do that. So let's go ahead and we're going to close in prayer. We're going to finish the class. Any questions before we close real quick? Okay.